So one of the big issues with Bitcoin, I think really fundamental long-term one, is how fundamentally the proof-of-work security that Bitcoin depends on, it's made possible by custom hardware. So your TSMC, your Global Foundries, your Intel, you know, they're the people who actually make the chips that go into ASICs. And ultimately, you know, one kind of scorch earth strategy is just to go to these people and say, look, stop making Bitcoin mining hardware, or license your hardware and only make it available to certain approved people, or, you know, build in kill features in it. And, you know, there's a good example of something that's very hard to prevent. You know, people talk about proof of stake, but it looks like it's fundamentally less sound than, say, Bitcoin. It just can't provide the kind of security uh, guarantees. You know, that was kind of one of the things I talked about, touched on anyway, in my uh, talk. So proof of stake, you're skeptical of the, of the, of the security that proof of stake can, can provide? Like... Yeah, the issue with uh, proof of stake versus proof of work is proof of stake... You can think of it as what it proves is that someone, is that a group of people came to consensus that a certain timeline is acceptable. The problem is it does not prove anything that's only the one they did. So proof of stake systems suffer from the nothing at stake problem, where nothing stops the people with signing authority from creating an alternate version of history with completely different say, transactions that get in. And it's even worse than that, because going back in time, I mean, suppose a bunch of keys get compromised, say, three years back. You can rewrite the proof-of-stake blockchain from three years back by making use of these old keys. Now, in practice, what happens? Well, proof-of-stake systems inevitably just centralize. They have a central authority who goes and signs what is valid history, what isn't valid history. And it may be in practice that's... Uh, decentralized enough so that we can use social methods to really come to consensus. You know, if one central authority misbehaves, we'll switch to another central authority. And the time scales where this has to happen may be long enough that it doesn't matter. But, you know, that's obviously a much less pure uh, way of achieving consensus than proof of work. How do you know um, how centralized a proof of stake cryptocurrency can is? Like, I mean, as far as I imagine as far as you're looking at the blockchain, it could be, no, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, in a pure system, just like proof of work, it's, you can only know, you can only get evidence it is not centralized. Or, in a proof of stake in proof of work system, you can only get evidence that system is centralized. You can't get, get evidence that it isn't. You know, and this is really because one person can pretend to be multiple people. So those multiple people who you believe decentralized power could very well be controlled by one entity. Talk a little bit about the, the zero confirmation double spend and the, the possible attacks to retailers or, or anybody else that, you know, ATMs that, that rely on zero confirmation uh, trust. So essentially right now, uh, Bitcoin nodes, they tend... You know, they, do, they uh, only accept the first transaction they see to the mempool. And if they accept into the mempool, if the Bitcoin node's run by a miner, that means they'll mine blocks with that transaction in there. And if someone creates another transaction that double spends the first transaction, spends the same outputs but to a different um, destination, that second transaction gets rejected. Of course, in a decentralized system, what's first and what's second depends on what node. One, one node might see one transaction first, another node might see a different transaction first. And the blockchain, via proof of work, is what determines what is first and what's second. So when you go send someone money in Bitcoin, and you make the assumption that your transaction will be the one that... Or, sorry, I should say that when you, go, when you send money to someone in Bitcoin, and the receiver makes the assumption that the transaction they got is definitely the one that's going to end up in the blockchain, they're really making an assumption based on a pr principle that Bitcoin itself isn't designed to solve. Bitcoin only makes transactions guaranteed to confirm by confirmations, by appearing in blocks. If you're just trusting based on what nodes around the network happen to have, 
you're actually trusting a whole lot of people to do something in a specific way. Even worse than that, you know, it's often against their own incentives. You know, if the second transaction from the perspective of a node pays a lot more money in fees, then why shouldn't the miner mine transaction number two instead of transaction number one? You know, it's economically rational for them to mine it, and there's no downsides to mining a double spend. And there's also the issue that you, that if we rely on the system, when it breaks, the solutions that often get proposed at the mining level are very centralized solutions. Um, as an example, Mike Kern proposed the idea that miners should be able to vote to steal other miners' block rewards. So if I find a block and other miners think that it included a double spend, those other miners should be able to vote, and if they achieve a majority, they get to reassign my bitcoins to someone else. Of course, the technical implementation is just simply, I can go vote to go and reassign another person's bitcoins, and equally, from my perspective, the guy who mined a double spend, I may have no way of knowing that it was double spend, because everything's relative. If I see one transaction first, and then I see another one, I don't know what order other people saw them in. I can't. So the only way I could really guarantee that is to start going off to other miners and creating a central authority on what transaction came first. I'm sure this is what would happen if that got implemented, and one of the things I'm working on to try to stop that, you know, stop us going in those very harmful directions, is to go the other direction. Implement uh, what's called replace by fee. Simply whatever transaction pays you the most money as a miner is the one you should include. And that makes it very clear that unconfirmed transactions aren't secure, and it forces the entire ecosystem to have better solutions. Um, I once wrote my first version of those tools, maybe, uh, I think, last August or so, and released them. Um, I also released uh, some tools to do double spending. And in that case, I took advantage of other uh, techniques to exploit that not everyone sees the same transaction at the same time. And very quickly, you know, some people lost a fair bit of money, and it uh, seems to be that the market's reacted by not depending on unconfirmed transactions. Currently, very few people depend on them. You know, occasional ATM does for small amounts of money. You know, there's some person-to-person -person stuff that does, that does, but for the most part, companies go wait for confirmation. You know, for instance, when you go buy something on, uh, when you go buy something that's going to be shipped to you, they'll wait for confirmation before actually giving the package to FedEx. They may go tell you, yeah, you've paid instantly, but they're not actually going to send you the product until then. Is this zero confirmation, it's not a big problem right now, right? Like a lot of ATMs are just, how do the ATMs deal with this problem of people wanting cash instantly now? Well, a lot of them will not give you cash instantly. You know, that's the way they've solved it. And, uh, you know, they've, they've had to solve this because ATM operators have lost a lot of money from accepting unconfirmed transactions. You know, the reality is you can't assume they will confirm. Uh, experience has shown that to be true. You know, some tra some ATM operators have lost five figures worth uh, money from this before they learned that yeah, this is just isn't guarantee Bitcoin can provide. And currently, if you go to one of those operators, either a they'll use um, they'll make it you know take advantage of the fact that they know your identity in some way. Maybe they have cameras. Maybe they have your phone number. Maybe you'd be forced to show identification. So that if you double spend, you know, there's a risk of legal threats. And also B, a lot of them and probably basically all of them for large amounts, when you deposit a large amount of bitcoins into the ATM, it just forces you to wait for confirmation. You know, I've used one myself where it spits out a receipt, you get a little code, and you go back ten minutes later when uh transactions confirmed, you type in the code and you get your money. Now one of the arguments against altcoins and all the like the 800 plus competitors that are behind Bitcoin is that Bitcoin can integrate any major innovation that they they come up with. Her block time is seems to be one of those more difficult ones to implement. Is it possible that this is a an opening in competition for faster confirmation altcoins to come and try to serve the the ATM market? You know, I think faster confirmations is a pretty silly thing to be doing because you know, confirmation time is a trade-off between security of your coin and also convenience. 
and the altcoins that you know try to push this down say one minute thirty seconds they're making their coins much less secure because it now means that if you're a mining pool with more hashing power you earn proportionally more money than if you're a smaller pool and that difference becomes more and more extreme as the blockage roll gets smaller and smaller and your proximity to other miners as well as your size becomes more and more important for your profitability. You know, 10 minutes is a very conservative number and equally like one minute. One minute is still a pretty long time to wait for most applications. You know, if I'm trying to go pay in bitcoins for a donut, the cashier wants me to get out of there in like five seconds. They don't want to wait that long. Yet, five seconds will never be something Bitcoin can guarantee or any system like it. Did you hear about the dark coins instant transactions? They, they revealed this sort of feature recently. It seems very much geared towards retail services and, and, and stopping the double step and no confirmation problems. Guarantee you, dark coins instant transactions are going to get broken sometime. You know, we're not going to see it, probably because no one actually uses it. But you just can't have a decentralized system that comes to consensus that fast. You know, it's not going to happen. You can have systems that punish people after the fact for a double spend. Um, you know, I've often talked about one myself called uh, replace by fee scorched earth, which is the notion that if someone double spends you, the moment you detect it, you spend the bitcoins they sent you, all the transaction fees, and you're essentially saying, fuck you, don't try to screw me over, I'm going to destroy this money so that you do not end up having a reason to do this and potentially I destroy say a security bond you put up as well you know to further punish you it's not guaranteed that this will happen but probabilistically it discourages you from doing things because economically you're not going to make more money by trying to double spend than just behaving honestly is there a way to to prove a double spend outside of like only looking at the blockchain or only looking at, at decentralized data or do you need to sort of you can easily prove that someone created a double spend but you can't improve prove intent and one of the things is often creating double spends is actually a very natural thing to do you know if you have a transaction that takes a long time to confirm you can double spend it with another transaction that pays higher fees you know if you have if you do 10 transactions in a row you can keep double spending the first one and add more inputs to it and more outputs you know, you, there's all sorts of reasons to go modify transactions after the fact. It's, you know, the question is, why did you do that and what's the effect? In many cases, there is no harmful effect. So, I mean, I'd stress the problem replaced by fee solves is a bigger issue than a problem with Bitcoin directly. It's more of a problem of how people use Bitcoin and where it may develop in the future. Replaced by fee is really saying, use Bitcoin in a way that's secure in a decentralized system. You know, that's secure without trusting people across an entire network. Now, you may choose to, as an individual, secure, double, you know, secure transactions from double spends by using central authorities between two parties that they've chosen to use. But you get to go choose a party. You're not blindly trusting everyone on the network like the current unconfirmed transaction system works. And equally, you don't create incentives for people to try to centralize the network. You know, and really, I'd, I see this as a pragmatic thing where by encouraging replace by fee, we ensure that Bitcoin evolves towards a better system in the future rather than evolving essentially by panics to a more centralized system to try to provide guarantees that a decentralized system can't provide.